Uh, hello, my name is Adrian Buller. Uh, this is for my capstone project. And this is an interview with uh, Dr. David. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I'd like to ask is, do you mind how this footage is used? Because I was thinking of maybe, you know, putting it on YouTube, just raw. And... I have no objections. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So the first thing I'd like to ask is, what is your field of biology? Um, molecular ecology. So basically using um, genetic tools to do wildlife biology, population biology. So studying the distribution and abundance of species. Yeah. All right. Uh, how did you get into biology and you know making a business out of it, the entrepreneurship side of that? Mm, um, the alternative was a job. Yeah, it just looking around for a way to to. Um, when I didn't really go to school looking for a career, I went to school because I was interested. And then at the end of that, the jobs that were available weren't what I wanted to do. And so really it was just a, it was more about lifestyle, I think, than anything. Just trying to find a way to, to uh, work a reasonable number of hours um, and still do the sort of work that um, I'd developed skills in. So that, that's kind of where that came from. Pretty typical Nelson story, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was it that there was no work uh, in the general area or was it that there you know, wasn't much work available in general? No, I mean, the way careers tend to go in academic science is, you know, once you get through school, um, you're going to have a decade or two decades of, you know, 60 to 80 hour weeks. Just it's a real rat race. Um, doing a, trying to juggle way more things than a person can do well. I don't really function well that way. I prefer to take on one thing and do it well and slowly. And um, that's really not how academics works. You're teaching and doing a lot of admin and, and then supervising students and writing papers and writing grants. And it's just, there's, there's more things going on than, than what you can do well typically. And that just, and it also doesn't leave any time for the, for, uh, um, you know, if you want to spend time with your kids as they're growing up, there's no time for that really. So that's, I, yeah, it was, it was a, an avoidance issue for me. I, I looked at those jobs and didn't want to do them. Yeah. yeah. All right. So it was more that it was the only way for you to do the yeah. work that you wanted to do. Yeah, to basically to have a reasonable lifestyle and still do population genetics, which is my my field. Yeah. All right. Um, what do you think experts in biology and you know business look for in prospective talent? You know, what would you look for when you're hiring someone? Yeah, I mean, our so our case um, may not be typical because. I mean, when you look at the, at the sorts of questions really in in any organization that, that people ask in a job interview, um, they would be very different from what, what we're looking for. Um, and, you know, so basically I'll hire anyone who seems honest, down to earth, hardworking, and uh, interested in the, in the work we do. Um, they, they don't really, even if they don't have a degree in biology, um, you know, I've had uh, really successful employees who have basically come out of high school. Um, so it's more about aptitudes and, and, and our, because we're a niche, so we do something that basically no one else in the world does. Um, that gives us a little flexibility. Um, and so, and, and then the other thing is wildlife biologists don't really gravitate towards bullshit the way that society at large gravitates towards bullshit right now. So, you know, in a normal resume, you'd say, oh, I'm a team player, but independently motivated and all these sorts of, all these lines that they teach you to say. And, and um, wildlife biologists tend to be sort of apart from that stream of, 
everyone being on the same track and, and just spouting what they're told to spout. And so that's created a niche where, where by being very transparent with people, very direct with people, very honest, then we have that reputation around the world. And really that's actually what we sell. I mean, we do genetics and, and provide these services for wildlife managers, but the reason people know about us is because of how we interact with them. And I think that could actually be applied to any business, to be honest. People are so sick of, mm. of bullshit. Yeah, totally. So just the clarity and honesty is something that you find really important in a small I, business? I think so, yeah. I think you could you could pick any business and, and bring those qualities to it. And just the way everyone's so fed up now, I think you could actually be really successful. Yeah, totally. How That's my do you think it is to be interested in the work that you're doing? Yeah, I, I think it's really hard to do a, a super good job of something that you don't care about. Yeah. And, and so we're pretty focused on doing a good job. And uh, so, yeah, caring about it's a big deal. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm super into the, to the projects we work on. We, you know, in any business, you spend a lot of time writing emails to tell us or, or, you know, stuff like that. Like that's just how life is. Right. Um, you'll spend more time doing that than doing the thing that, that got you interested in the first place. But you know, there's still 30% of my time or something is still directed at doing the things that got me here that I was interested in. And that's, that's good. That's better than most jobs. So, yeah. All right. Um, have you heard of biogerontology? And if so, what do you know? No. Uh, so biogerontology is simply the study of aging. You know, yeah. And uh, it goes into, you know, it, it's more into the genetics of what makes people age. And sure. the whole goal of it in the general fields right now is, you know, to make people age in their elder age have better years, like more good years sure. in life, right? Yeah. It's yeah. also kind of the step into um, elongating the lifespan. Totally. Um, so what are your thoughts on making a company focused on that specifically? You know, how, well, how would you go about making a company that is focused on, you know, kind of a product for people. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that I read about such things, it tends to be from a genetics perspective, right? So mm -hmm. the, the first things Very I think about, right? yeah. Yeah, um, you know, using genomics to look at whatever gene expression as it changes with age or loss of telomere length or whatever the, the various age associated um, genetic uh, responses are. Um, but yeah, I don't know how, um, how to think about where opportunities lie within that field. I mean, in a broad sense, it seems like a great time in history to be thinking about this because A, genomics tools exist and they didn't 20 years ago. And B, the boomers are this massive demographic um, that uh, is, is going to age our, our population distribution and uh, create a lot of demand. Um, so it seems like a great time to be thinking about those things, but the specific applications, I don't have enough technical knowledge to, mm -hmm. to know where the practical things are that you could that you could do. I mean, in our business, the stuff that I actually did, you know, from a research perspective, like publishing or whatnot, is is not exactly the same as the stuff we do here. Exactly for that reason, because because you have to for a business to work, you have to go where the money is, and so you have to provide some service that people want. And um, I don't know what those services would be, just because I'm not familiar with the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I know about it is the it is very heavily into genetics and uh, yeah. things about like senescent cells. Yeah. And uh, 
someone else I was going to do an interview with, Robert Arkin, who was, uh, did a lot of work with Drosophila flies, which, you know. Drosophila, yeah. 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 And uh, he changed their genetics and, like, increasing their lifespan by, like, 30%. Sure. And just small tweaks to genetics. And yeah. um, how, how feasible is that, you know, going forward, do you think, with people? Because I know that it takes a long time to, uh, you know, get those types of things into actual medical trials and, you know, go from flies to people is a big jump. Yeah. Well, for sure. And, and to go from understanding systems to manipulating them is, is also could be um, something that's decades. You don't really know um, what practical out outcomes are going to be there. But I mean, the field does seem to me to be right, you know, like that something will come of it, it seems to me. I wish I could remember something I read this fall about, yeah, senescent cells. I know there's been all kinds of really cool work in that area, but yeah. I mean, it does feel like a field that's that's going inexorably forward. Um, mm -hmm. But where and when it's going to land at, at something uh, marketable, that's super hard to forecast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you know, if you were to explain it to you know, a layman, uh, about manipulation? Yeah, I mean, so I was, um, my, my first genetic skill set was cloning. Um, we don't really do that so much anymore because we don't need to. There's different technologies, but um, yeah, you know, I... I grew up like snipping bits of DNA from, you know, one organism and putting them into a different one and using that to, to control systems, to grow enzymes that we need in the lab or whatever it is. So, so that sort of, you know, cutting and pasting manipulation is something that um, I've done a lot of and I'm very comfortable with. But of course, once you get into humans, then, um, and especially once you get into heritable things, um, then yeah, that's a whole different kettle of fish. I feel like it's um, it's a conversation, an ethical conversation at that point, and, mm -hmm. and one that might take generations for people to really figure out how they feel about it and what's going to be considered acceptable and what's not. You know, I, I feel like I'm actually of a generation where I don't. I think that conversation is going to outlive me. You know, I don't, I'm not going to know where, where we land in terms of manipulating human journal. As someone who's worked with genetics, uh, how safe would, do you feel it would be, you know, cause I, I I'd understand being worried about things like that. How safe do yeah. you think a finished product would be? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, you know, so the analogy that I can think of is like where I got my start, which was in, in plant uh, manipulation. And so when I got into it, uh, let's say about uh, 1991 or something like that, um, it was all pie in the sky. We were going to make crop plants that were more tolerant to drought or, you know, that resisted some kind of pest uh, better. And it was going to um, uh, increase yields on the same land base and, and, and do no harm. You know, it was really seen as a, yeah, just like, just like, I guess, you know, nuclear energy when people started working on it, they thought, oh, wow, unlimited power for humanity. And instead we got uh, Hiroshima, you know, and, um, and what happened with the plant stuff is all that, all the, the interesting technology got sucked up by Monsanto and Pioneer Hybrid and the big companies. And what they did is they provided us with a global swamp of glyphosate, you know? So it's like everything's Roundup resistant now, thanks to genetic manipulation. And you can just bathe all your crops in Roundup and, and, uh, and then and suddenly the, the planet's swimming in that stuff. And I think it's a real serious mistake that we made there. 
So as with nuclear energy, we took that ability to manipulate crops and we just used it for profit in the most gross and damaging way that, that you could conceive of. And it, it shocked me and I left the field. Um, and I can totally see similar risks associated with, with the kind of, you know, manipulating human germlines. Um, yeah, that seems like the sort of thing where you might start out thinking, oh, great, let's get rid of Huntington disease, you know, which we could do with one, one generation of just screaming, you know, and we could have that disease gone forever, for example. And so you think, that's just like the way we were thinking with plants, you know, oh, this powerful technology and it's going to make things better. But, oh, man, you know, things don't go that way. So I'd, I'd be really, I'd be nervous. If yeah. those companies and that didn't happen, do you still think that, you know, genetically modifying plants could still be used for good? And if it wasn't, it would have been used for good? It is, it is being used for good. Um, and, you know, the, the problem isn't that, um, that everything's awful, it's that most things are awful. Um, so, you know, the, the example that geneticists like to talk about is golden rice, where, where you have a, create a rice strain that's a source of vitamin A. And, um, and you know, vitamin A deficiency is, is endemic in some human populations. And so by just simply adding that uh, gene to the, to the rice, you address a, a health lack and... It costs nothing and nobody owns the seeds. The farmers can still produce their own seeds, you know, unlike everything that like a Monsanto does where, where they actually sue farmers who keep their own seeds, even if they always kept their own seeds, you know, like this. this yeah, it's just horrible. Um, so and, kind of, yeah. Uh, so kind of like um, when they added iodine to salt, you know, yeah. up with gas. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, and then and then it's it's free and it's always present, and and um, and you know producing a, a little bit of vitamin A uh, in a in a rice plant is definitely not going to create some scary uh, outcome. So it's a there's there's nothing there that I see that that has anything but positive, and that's one example that's great, and and then beside that there's a bunch of negative examples. So, yeah. That's the that's the trick finding the finding you know nuclear energy without uh, you know mm. dropping bombs yeah totally so uh, as someone who works you know with genetics what have you thought of new advancements like CRISPR again the not tools that I've had hands-on experience with, so I don't really speak as an expert. Um, the, the, you know, the sort of manipulation tools that, that I worked with are, are very outdated now, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and I understand there are technical limitations with every technique, so you hear commentary about, oh, it wasn't as straightforward as you thought, or some, something like that. But, but in principle, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's really cool to have tools that can specific create specific modifications that might be advantageous. You know, I think it always has to be done with some caution. But uh, um, yeah, I, they're the modern version of the tools that I used to use and be comfortable with. So, yeah. Could you explain how that works, or uh, explain what? You're doing? Yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah, no CRISPR. I, yeah. I'd make mistakes if I got into it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Go back to the questions. Um... And it's not even clear now, right? I think CRISPR is even starting to become a little bit old technology. I think there's. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like seven years? Or... Yeah. Well, it's been around for a while, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, so do you think that the biogerontology research is important? Do you think that that's something that we should be spending our money and looking into and, and trying for? I think so. That's, you know, as a, 
just as a as a normal person. I don't like I don't know that my science background gives me any special insights because it's an ethical issue. But the idea of, of extending a healthy portion of people's lives in particular, I think, is is quite worthwhile. And you know, if that includes extending life altogether, well, I think I'm pretty supportive of that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if I was trying to spend money today to make sure that people lived a larger portion of their lives in good health, I would spend money on vaccinations in there, for, you know, for, you know, for a dollar a head, you can, you can do things that would be very complex to do in the lab, you know. So really what we're talking about here is a, is a, is a rich people discussion, like ways to make rich people's lives better. And, you know, just being who I am, if I, if I had resources to do that sort of work right now, I would focus on the low hanging fruit, you know, because there are so many cheap things we could do, like delivering clean water and vaccines and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That would improve the lifespan and the healthy lifespan of such an enormous population for so much less money. And then, that, you know, that's where I would focus my energy from the ground up. But that's that's not a business idea. That's if you want to be in business, you have to work with people who have money. Mm -hmm. So profit is very important if you want to get anything done. Yeah. Um, what yeah. do you think of that kind of more science fiction aspect of it? Of you know a person who you know doesn't have a natural lifespan. Oh well, yeah, very right. far out. I don't know that I can think of it any differently than anyone else. You know, it's, it's a cool idea to think about. Maybe we. And we'd be a little more careful with the world around us if we knew we were going to still be in it in 500 years. I don't know. Yeah. That's yeah. always kind of been like, you know, something I've tried to look forward to. You know, I, I want to push it forward. So, you know, the way I think about it is every, I believe it's going to happen eventually. I, I think that that's just the train we're going with this kind of research. And, you know, yeah, right. Yeah. Into but uh, yeah. you know what they, they say in science, which is that progress is, is achieved one funeral at a time, right? And uh, there is something to be said for turnover, too, because, you know, once you get, um, you know, once you get out of your 20s, most of your ideas are pretty formulated at that point, and you start to become a barrier to progress, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, I have not changed my views very much in, in the past few decades, and... Uh, I probably won't. So, you know, a lot of times uh, in science, what you have to do is wait until the, the, the stubborn uh, folks who've been clinging to the same uh, concepts for 50 years uh, move along and make space for the new ideas, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there's something to be said for some churn of humanity as well, some fresh brains with fresh ideas. Yeah. I've always thought of it as something like... Uh, you know, if it's an eventuality and how much it would suck to be, you know, the person who's a day off from the research that would have saved their life. <laughs> the last one, yeah. You know, totally. the last person before, you know, something I see is... is I mean, this, this becomes very philosophical, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Personally, yeah. I want to make a company because I think that's the, the most I can help push the whole field forward. You know, I want, totally. I want to try and the money to do the research, to, you know, yeah. so to take those days off, you know, bring it one step closer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the way this, this business came into being, it wasn't, um, certainly wasn't looking from way off in the future. You know, it was sitting in grad school and, you know, sitting around with people and drinking coffees and talking about, you know, how could a person, you know, get a job that, that uh, is a little more humane than the ones that academia offers. And, um, and uh, you know, so that would be 15 years past the point where you're at today, you know, a couple degrees under your belt and a whole bunch of learning and 
a whole bunch of developments that take place during that time interval. And then you sit there and go, hmm, now what can I, what can I piece together from today's situation? Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's the tricky thing with gerontology and, and genetics is, is um, it is evolving so quickly. So it feels like something that you'd have to get into from an academic angle and get those degrees under your belt and really learn about some things and then, and then see what sort of doors might open from there. And, um, you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. So uh, how important do you think it is to, you know, make connections at university in an academic field? And what is it like making those connections? Right. Yeah. I'm a whore. I'm probably the worst networker that has ever passed through a university. I just tend to work on my own. Um, those connections are, are a big deal. The thing that, that made my work possible for me was the publications. So connecting with people through your published work. Um, absolutely, I had connections with people that I still work with today. You know, so when I was a student, I, you know, contacted biologists to see if I could get samples from them or something like that. And those turn out to be people who've been my customers now for 20 years. Uh, so those, those connections were, were definitely there, but um, I've never been one to go to a conference because when I go to a conference, I find that I get less new information than I would get by spending the same amount of time with some journals reading. And uh, because I don't think it's ethical to get in an airplane and fly to a conservation biology conference. So I think it does more net harm than, than um, really it's, it's more fun, I think, than it is learning those things. You get together with your buddies and have a good time in a fun place and it's really fun and someone else pays for it. But I, I don't know that, I don't know how ethical it is. And so that's something I've always actually avoided. I, a very rare conference attender. And people will say that those conferences are critical for establishing your career path. Maybe so, I'm pretty happy with mine. So yeah, right. lots of different ways to to, to get to, to something that works as a career. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, why did you choose biology as a career other than just interest? Like, was there any a uh, turning moment maybe in high school or just a time where you really got into it? Yeah, I think I've always been interested in, um, in you know, you would say nature when you're, you know, I read Never Cry Wolf in elementary school. You know, that was probably a big deal for me. Um, and the truth is we work on all sorts of problems today with wolves, you know, um, wolves and caribou, for example, super hot topic in British Columbia right now. Um, and, um, so, you know, that's a good interest in, in, you know, what you'd call ecology, um, uh, was always there for me. So when I went to school and it's pretty obvious that my, my skills were in science, even if my interests were broader. And so I went into general science and I was definitely on the biology side of things, you know, chemistry and physics didn't capture my imagination probably because even from elementary school and you know i was interested in, in nature uh, why i went into genetics because at the university where i was i wanted to take a lot of anthropology courses there was maybe six or eight anthropology courses that i really wanted to take and the program that allowed me to take the most arts courses was honors genetics so i went into genetics so I got a science degree while studying anthropology. <laughs> so, you know, I guess maybe that's the theme of this interview, right? Like there's not all paths are very direct. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if this is, would your company be considered a biotech company? I think so. Yeah. I mean, just wondering like, the terminology. 
Yeah, I don't know either because, you know, people will, you know, if, if someone has a company that, that uh, you know, they paint houses, they're going to call themselves, you know, spray tech or something like that. You know, tech is in everything now. It's, you can't do anything without calling it tech. Uh, we do molecular biology, you know, we're at a lab bench using the tools of molecular biology. So, you know, what, what biotech often implies is patents. You know, you get a piece of information, you gain ownership over that piece of information, and then you sell it to others, and that's not what we do. So if that's what biotech means to you, we actually do the opposite of that. We get information and we share it as widely as possible so that everybody can use it. So very old school. So, All right. yeah. Uh, we, we kind of went over why you did. So what, what, yeah. what was the process of making your company? How did that go and, and what are the steps? Yeah, I mean, it started with, with grad school, sitting around just chewing the fat with people and, and wondering how to have a non-academic career in, in population genetics. Um, and then, um, you know, just by chance getting involved in some projects that were applied to the wildlife management projects as a grad student and and seeing that there was there was some practical value that wildlife managers would pay for in those projects. So not something premeditated, something that happened, something I resented because I wanted to work on academic projects and these were applied projects that weren't as interesting, you know. And uh, so at the time I I, I I kind of did those projects to appease people rather than because I was interested, but then they turned out to have, you know, practical opportunities. And then what it really took to make the company start was someone with money, someone who knew the customer side of the equation, a biologist, and someone with an academic background. And so we started out with, um, with me and three other core people, each of whom brought one of those key ingredients. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's how we got going. All right. Uh, we, we've kind of talked about what research you work on, but could you give a uh, simple explanation, say, in like, uh, you know, uh, an in-depth explanation and then uh, cut it down to maybe a sentence too? Yeah. So ecology at its heart is the study of distribution and abundance. Where are species found? How many are there? Uh, and that's what we do. We use genetic tools to assess distribution and abundance. Um, so, um, you know, if you have a, to take an example of a distribution project, um, uh, you might wonder, you know, are caribou still being found in, you know, the South Selkirks or something like that? So you go out and collect a bunch of ungulate pellet samples and collect DNA from the surface and then use mitochondrial DNA sequencing to identify the species. Um, and so that's a really simple sort of distribution question. Um, the abundance questions that we work on are done through what's called mark recapture. So, you know, historically what you do is maybe set some traps and maybe capture a bunch of bears and put ear tags in them. And then you go out two months later and capture a bunch more and see how many have ear tags. And then you look at that recaught fraction and use that to estimate the total population size. The difference is what we do is we go out and get a bunch of bear hair samples using barbed wire, uh, barbed wire strung around trees with something smelly in the middle that bears are interested in. So they go in under the barbed wire, they leave hair. We analyze the hair to see, to identify individuals and then you go back in two weeks and get more hair and see if it's the same individuals or new individuals. So that's the recapture phase. And we'll do something like that maybe three or four times and do some mathematical modeling to come up with an estimate of how many individuals are present. So that's actually sort of the bread and butter project that we would do, like counting the number of bears in a mountain range. That's, that's the real practical example of a project that we would work on. 
except that we only do the lab part. So people from, you know, guy in Poland collects brown bear sample, hair samples and sends them to us. And then we do the individual identification, send them back the data, you know, in the spreadsheet. Yeah. All right. Um, what do you think everyone should know about your fields of biology? Like every person. Gee. If you were going to tell every person on earth one thing about what you do, what would it be? Man, we have to get back to that one. I, I, I don't, I don't know. That's fine. Yeah, I, um, yeah. What are some of the ethical boundaries you work inside? Yeah, yeah, you know, so an interesting, we mostly work for the good guys, people who are interested in, in keeping wildlife populations healthy and present, um, people with whom I'm philosophically aligned, in other words. And that can be NGOs, you know, might be uh, World Wildlife Fund, or usually it's a wildlife management agency, um, you know, like the provincial government in BC or something like that. Sometimes we work for mining companies, and they um, they couldn't care less. You know, they've been mandated by their agreement to throw a certain number of dollars at wildlife management and so they do it and then they get a report and they throw it under a desk or burn it or something and uh, the data never becomes public and uh, they just literally see it as a joke and um, uh, you know I try really hard to, to say no to folks like that um, and the other thing is when you work with jerks they tend to be jerks on on all levels so you know, the only people we've ever had to chase for years on end to pay their bills are mining companies. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a coincidence, right? You know, the, the, the good guys always just pay their bills, you know? And and uh, and when you need some information from them, they respond, you know, even if it, uh, it's not what they want today. Whereas the, when you get into the sort of applied mining sort of world, it's uh, nobody does anything for you unless it's in their interest. It's really gross. So... Yeah, I think whether to work on projects like that is probably the thing that, that we run into and contemplate. Do we make a little money here or do we uh, work on things that uh, are actually positive? Yeah, totally. All right. Um, what do you think people interested in creating their own business should know about business? You know, I... It's, you know, if you interviewed 100 people, you, you probably get 99 aligned uh, around some basic core concepts, and then you get me. And, you know, so you've got me here on the phone, and so I'll give my answer, which is nothing. You know, you should, you should come at whatever job you do, whether you're planting trees or starting a biotech business, with interest and with positive intentions and with the absolute focus being to treat employees and customers and everybody well so that they come away from the interaction uh, mm -hmm. feeling like it was a worthy interaction. And then your employees are going to work harder and your customers are going to come back and you're never going to have to advertise and you just get to work with people you like, you know, physically in the building and then also the people that you provide service to. And um, so that's that's what I would say is just just come at it with that with with the motivation of trying to improve the day of the other people that come into your sphere of influence during your business day. And I actually think that's going to be a winning model for business. And you know stuff like you know how to do currency conversions in your year end. You know stuff like that. Like, you know, this practical business hopes you got to jump through, you know, you just learn that stuff. That's just, that's just information. Anyone can learn that stuff. There's accounting software. There's, there's banks to help you uh, figure out what you need to do. There's, you know, there's 
lawyers and folks who are gonna who are gonna get you through the steps that you have to get through. And I don't think you need to to know very much about business, really. Yeah. It's good to hear that. Yeah. Um. What are some negatives about your job? Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, email. It's probably the negative about everybody's job. <laughs> Nobody does anything, they just write emails. Now. And um, I, think, I think that just kind of captures the sense of, you know, when you get good at something, then what happens is you inevitably stop doing it and you start administering it. You know, administrating it so you're you know working on contracts and you're chasing bills and talking to the bank and you know all this stuff that that isn't the thing that you were actually good at in the first place and that's not specific to this job that's just kind of the, the nature of job um, um honestly that's it you know if i could do the science stuff it's not, it's not as academically exciting as the stuff I used to publish about, but I don't care. I don't need to set the world on fire. I just need to, to have my little sphere of influence and make it positive. So, um, yeah, no, I'm super satisfied with the science side of, of what we do here. Yeah. All right. Uh, what are some negatives or issues you've had in your career? I mean, grad school is not great for your mental health, you know, writing, writing paper after paper after paper at two o'clock in the morning, you know, that's, that's a good way to kiss your 20s goodbye, you know. Uh, my kid who's, who's 20 has already done more traveling and had more fun than I had by the age of 35, so that's a negative, you know. Um... So just grad school? Just how hard you have to work to really to really develop, you know, the sort of reputation that you can that people will then seek you up. And you mm -hmm. have to work really hard for that. And you just have to decide where, you know, what the balance is. Um, I don't I don't really feel like there's been a bunch of obstacles. The whole thing has come together kind of serendipity. I just feel like I've been extraordinarily lucky. Uh, at every step, just made decisions and at, at random, and had them turn out really well. And I don't know, I don't know why that is, you know. Well, but I think, yeah, good luck probably has something to do with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, what are some positives that? Yeah, you know, I know you talked about enjoying the scientific side of it. Is there? Oh, any sure. That you enjoy. I mean, uh, so the nice thing is in the, you know, in the past decade or so when my kids have been, you know, growing up um, and um, I've been able to spend time with them. That's massive because I'm not working that hard. I'm not, I'm not putting in the big hours like, like I would have been in, in uh, grad school. That's amazing. You know, that's, that's something where if you miss that in your life, boy, you don't get it back. So massive. Um, and then, um, you know, the other thing is I actually spend my day in the company of people I like. Mm -hmm. And when you look around you at people at their jobs, not everybody is that lucky, to put it mildly. Yeah. So um, that's pretty insanely positive. Yeah. And I live in Nelson, which, you know, if I was a, wanted an academic career, I would not live in Nelson. So, <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, what are some of your greatest accomplishments? Greatest accomplishments? <laughs> you know, the, the work I published in grad school about, um, about assessing individual ancestry using genotypes. So to be able to pick up immigrant individuals, for example. Um, I think that that work, those publications, uh, had an impact were important and you know kind of 
it was the sort of the early phases of of um, the stuff where we do now, like twenty three and Me, where you're learning about your own ancestry or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, you know, I was fortunate to be getting into that sort of work right in the very first year where it became possible. That's when I was starting grad school, and so I think some of that work was was important in its day. Um, yeah, hmm. yeah, providing jobs for bunch of families in Nelson. Yeah. You know, That's raising good. a couple solid kids. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be it. Uh, so here I'd like to say, you know, what my general plan for yeah. what I'd like to do. Yeah. Uh, my plan so far is to try and go to UBC. Uh, yeah. Go to do one of the programs there. I haven't picked exactly which one I want to do, but I know it's going to be biology yeah uh, genetics based and then they also mm-hmm. have a new program which you can kind of combine your bachelor's with uh another bachelor's which is a master's of management it's not a master's oh, yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's for solder yeah. and um i've wanted to kind of use those connections and use my information on the academic side to yeah. build a company yeah fund the the research pretty much and yeah. uh, I I don't know how feasible it is until I've actually gone to business school of course but I want to kind of you know make a for profit company because I, I I don't think I you know do as much as a non profit I I just I think I can do more good with a for profit company because it's harder to get large amounts of money coming into something without it being like that and uh, hopefully get people interested in, you know, extending their lives and, mm-hmm. and uh, eventually, you know, getting, cause I, I, I feel like that's something that can connect any group of people, you know, you're rich, you're poor, you know, you want to see your grandkids, your great grandkids, yeah. especially as people are having kids later and later, or maybe you want to go traveling or, you know, yeah. you want to do something. And yeah. uh, I, I I hope to be able to make a company like that and, you know, have people donate and, and if possible, by the end of it, be able to subsidize the, whatever comes out of it and give it to the people who donate, you know. Totally. <clears throat> totally. We, um, yeah. I mean, so, so my first response would be, you know, when you're looking at that university calendar and so you're picking a program, but my, you know, my first thought is don't fuss too much about the program. Fuss about the classes that interest you because mm-hmm. that's where, you know, you're probably not going to end up where you think you're going to end up because none of us do. Um, you know, my first co- company was uh, a carpentry company. So, you know, you don't know where you're going to go. Um, but, you know, take classes that capture your imagination. You just see a subject and you're like, wow, that's a thing I want to know. And, you know, you might sit down in a lecture one day or read a paper and just go, damn, that's cool, you know. And in, in genomics, you know, maybe it's gerontology, but, you know, maybe it's using genomic tools to, you know, fight malaria or who knows what, right? And where you can have a massive impact on... Uh, people's lives because mm-hmm. um, the tools are just yeah. I feel like I could do more if I give other people that money you know like I I feel as though I am one man you know what what I could do in that field doing the research personally is not as much as if I you know gave a hundred people or a thousand people that money to sure do yeah and things like that yeah yeah I mean uh, so that you know the motivation yeah. Yeah. That's kind of why I asked earlier about like how much yeah. you like doing it. Because for me, yeah. I definitely have a passion for it. It's my dream. It's yeah. what I want to do. Sure. But, you know, I, and I, I've had fun in biology and I, I, I'm pretty good. At, I've done all my sciences, right? Yeah. I, and I understand them. I enjoy them. I have since I was little. But it's yeah. never been like I, what I wanted to go into before was physics. And sure. I decided that I wanted to do this instead because, you know, I find that goal, you know, too irresistible. Sure. Absolutely. 
Yep. Um, totally. But you know, don't, uh, don't canalize your thoughts too much just yet, you know, cause oh, you yeah. Know, I, 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 understand yeah. That too. Yeah. Yeah. I know that, you know, like you were saying earlier, a lot of it's luck. That's, that's a part of totally. my personal mantra, you know, and there's, there's going to be, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there and some of the 7 billion are chosen by probability just to, you know, have everything work out. And I don't know if I'm people, but you know, just because there's a small chance it's going to happen. Doesn't yeah, well, you're a Canadian white guy, so you're probably, yeah, <laughs> you're at the high end of the probability. Yeah. Things are going to work out for you. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, I'll just try my best and go for it. And if I don't make it, well, at least I tried. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And you'll run into, you know, you'll run into stuff that'll just explode your brain. Right. And maybe stuff that isn't even uh, understood today, you know, so there's, yeah, I definitely had moments like that where I just started reading something, you know, and went, wow, where could you go with that? You know, and that happened when I was like 25 or 30, you know, so um, there's, there's lots of room for, um, but you know, genomics in general, holy cow, is the genomes are just the coolest thing on earth. I mean, <laughs> genomes are just, from a biology perspective, genomes are just super cool. So learning about genomes is, is, is right on yeah and then the other thing is you know to, you can you can also separate things out right so like in this business we make our money doing population genetics and selling it to wildlife managers and um and then we spend our money uh supporting uh, education programs in latin america you know peru and bolivia and um so that's actually why I still go to work is to pay teachers' salaries in Bolivia, because uh, that's where I think yeah, passion. It's that thing that keeps you. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't necessarily need to continue being here for my own uh, reasons. So I, uh, you know, you do something that. that... Sorry, there, yeah. the school's totally. ending now. Some people are coming by, but that's the totally. young we got yeah. time. If that's fine. Yeah, the point is you can have, you can make your money in one field and, and then use it to make an impact in something that might be completely unrelated, right? So there's, again, just lots of, lots of ways to approach things, yeah. Yeah, that, that is why I'd like to try and, you know, make as much money as possible so I can create the biggest impact. I understand that. Um, so uh, we got a few more questions left, if that's fine. Sure. Uh, yeah. What are some problems or positives you see with the, my business plan? You know, what I want to do? Well, I wouldn't say problem, but I, I just think the the thing that you can't really that you're sort of powerless to work with right now is just the, the rapid state of advance you know that, that you don't know you don't know where things are going to be at right so um you know i can think of people who went to study as postdocs in a you know in a really good lab and uh and so they write a proposal for a research project for their postdoc and you know this is maybe nine months ahead of time and the, and there's their supervisor their uh to be We'll say, well, you're not going to work on that project because if we knew that it was interesting work, we'd be doing it today. We wouldn't wait nine months for you to show up. You know, so sometimes things just move so quick that even when you're a postdoc applying for a position for next year, you actually don't know what you're going to work on because you don't know the state of the information a year from now. You know, and I, I think in the sort of field you're looking at, man, by the time you're 30, it's you, you're going to look back and go, wow, who would have seen that coming? So. Yeah, that's a that's a sort of place where you don't have much power, and you just gotta roll with it a bit. It's good to know. Yeah. Um, if you were trying to market funding biology or ontology research to the general population, what would you talk about, or how would you go about it? Wow. Yeah, this is where I'm about as good at, at fundraising ideas as I am at networking ideas. Um, not something I've been very fortunate to not ever have to worry about, you know, that sort of fundraising stuff. Um, wow. 
that's really interesting thinking about how the science community talks about this genomic stuff with the population at large, especially when you think about like with crop manipulation and this sort of pushback that that uh, that's received. Um, that's interesting because that's a that's an area where historically people have really sucked. You know, the science has done a bad job of communicating to people where where the concerns are and where they aren't and and uh, yeah I, you know I, I think I would speak in really vague terms about just information being so important and putting people at ease you know um, just thinking about the COVID regulations that we have right now coming from the province and you know and, how a lot of times it comes down as a, you know, okay, this is closed now, and then you know, but this one's open, so you can't do that. And, and I wish what what there was is more information about well, actually, the virus is transmitted, um, you know, through speaking uh, at close range to people, and so uh, you know, try to really focus on that. You know, just I, I just think genomics and especially modifying genomes is something where getting information to people is going to be make or break in terms of how far that sort of stuff is allowed to by society to, to go. And we've certainly seen that with the crop stuff where, where, you know, society has not embraced genetically modified foods. You know, you go in the grocery store, it's like no GMOs. Yeah. Um, you want to avoid that somehow. And it seems to me that explaining, finding a way to communicate information about what's actually happening is really, really important. Yeah. All right. Um, got, I think we'll just go to the last one. What are some good resources people or companies to look into if they're interested in what you do specifically? Um, I mean, our website tells you a little bit about what we do um, and leads to the literature and the sort of work we do, it's, it is with people who have a sort of formal academic background in biology. And so the literature is where, is where you end up when you want to learn stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's where... Yeah, I'm still thinking about your question about what should everybody know. I don't know what they need to really. You know, it's really fun that I see videos of bears rubbing against a tree and leaving behind a hair sample that you can genotype or something like that. You know, that's 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 pretty fun to see. And but do you need to know about what happens in the lab between the bear doing that and the the, the information that comes out the other end? I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, is there anything you'd like to talk about or things you think I should know as a kind of a closing statement? Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've, uh, I've made a lot of uh, uh, broad philosophical statements, so I, can't, <laughs> I don't know what, what's been left unsaid. Oh, uh, yeah. No. I mean, I, I would just say go out there and uh, with an open mind and learn stuff that's cool. And there's definitely genomics is a a field that I've always thought was cool and it's just gotten cooler. So, no. No. Well, thank you for your time and it was wonderful talking to you. Awesome. Okay, well, best of luck with your pursuits. I, I hope I hear about um, yeah, where it ends up. Yeah, totally. I hope you hear it too. Sweet. Okay. Have a good day. Yeah, you too.